It's a podcast called Podcast UFO. Um, this gentleman I did not know about until he did the um, an interview with Jonathan Wagant. Are you familiar with Jonathan Wagant and his mm-hmm. testimony to Dr. Greer back in the day? Is that the soldier guy? Redneck bull? Yep. I um, fucking love that interview. That's one of yes. my favorite interviews ever, son. I, I Yo, I, dan- I, I watched that interview like probably no lie like four or five times. I don't mind listening to it again. It is that, a good one. That boy got all his story down pat. He explained that shit where he, as little fat as he could. He gave you what you needed to understand and got to the point. He's really no nonsense. I did hear some people say that some of his military history that he goes over at the beginning of the original um, Dr. Greer um, testimony, that some of it might not track with like the mission he was on or something. I don't know anything about the military, so I can't comment on that. But literally, other than that, I haven't heard many people doubt his story. So I agree. It was the story that got me like, after I watched his testimony, I was like, I believe this man. This sounds re- very realistic, um, well, the way he tells it. Well, the thing is, I, I never really told my how I can. I, I explained it that I use, that for remote viewing, I use the idea of quantum uh, entanglement as a way to understand what might happen. But for me, UFOs was, uh, I was doing a lot of religious debating, right? And, you know, I I sat down and, I and you know, my thing is I started getting to the point where I was just tired of the arguments. I knew what was going to be said. I already knew what I had to say and never nothing ever changed, right? So I started wondering, you know, about the story itself. Like, I've read the Bible and shit like that and all that good shit. And the idea came to me, what would be more likely? That there is a supernatural being that can control all things and create us and cares what we wear if you mix your cottons all the bullshit the bible says or that there is a possibility that humans came into contact with species from another world and we created a religion around that and and when you look at what's this motherfucker's edge the guy with the edge (laughs) so with wagant he um he did one interview with greer back in the day that you know we've all seen And then he did an interview a few months ago. He completely fell off the radar. Um, I tracked him down like four years ago on Instagram. And it kind of was like a semi-inactive account. It didn't really seem like he kept up with it. But I did DM him. And I'm just like a shot in hell. I just sent him a message. Not for any other reason than I had found him. um, Just to say, hey, your testimony was like insane, whatever. Um, But he really had no light on him. He didn't do interviews. He didn't do nothing. Nobody heard from Wagant for all those years until a few months ago, he did an interview with this podcast UFO, which I did share on my profile. There's a link to it. If anybody's curious, I'll throw it in the nest in a second. Um, And now this interview that came out today, also from podcast UFO, is an interview with Wagant and Michael Herrera, who is the gentleman that came out with Dr. Greer and his most recent uh, disclosure effort. I forgot what it's called. Um... But yeah, so seeing these two sit down together um, is kind of interesting. I guess they've been in contact with each other for a few months. Like, they had, like, become friendly. Um, oh, you was, said Herrera and Wigan sat down. Yes. Oh, I, I, I thought you were talking about two separate interviews or something. Oh, that's that's interesting. I was originally referencing Wagan's original OG interview, but the one that right, I'm okay. here to talk about now that dropped today is an interview on the, that uh, on podcast UFO with Herrera and with Wagan together. Oh, baby. So yeah. I'll, I'll nest it if anybody has anything they want to chime in on before you, I do a clip. Go ahead, you Sarah. You tickled my fancy. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Asaf Dove King. Garrett, Pavel, UFO, uh, Lizell. Uh, sorry. I was collecting my thoughts, but then you told me that you're sharing the interview in the nest. And I suppose I wanted to, like, catch this talk, but I hadn't listened to this yet. But I know Herrera's story. But Wagant's, I don't know quite yet as well because he was, as you said, fly to the radar. Um, in Dove, I know that 
I, I trust your, your intuition a hundred percent. Um, do you, do you feel like their stories are complimentary? Are they friends? Uh, what was your impression just before I dive into it? Sure. Um, I've not spent too much time comparing and contrasting, although that's a really good point. I probably should do that. Um, that's what I'm going to do. So, <laughs> that's what we should do. Um, but, uh, I mean, they are different. So, Wagans was a downcraft um, that he encountered in Peru in 1996, and he wasn't supposed to be there. I guess, like, he came almost like just before the crash. The actual crash retrieval team like descended upon the scene, from my recollection. Um, and the commonality that I will say between him and Herrera is the way they were treated by these, this like crash retrieval team or whatever security they had involved. Uh, they were very uh, not nice. They pointed weapons at them. They told them they'd fucking kill them. They told them they'd push them out of airplanes. Um, I think Weygand was held in custody at, for, for some period of time. Also commonality was none of them had like identification on their, on their like get up, like their garb or whatever. Um, so, so, so that is very similar. And I have thought about that before the way, the way that they were treated, um, and threatened to not, uh, tell anybody about what they had come across. So Wagant stumbled upon this similar to Michael then, right? Well, yes, they both stumbled across it, but Michael's was a hovering craft, you know, fully functional. And, and I think you might be more familiar with that one. Wagant's was a crashed craft, which he said appeared as though it had been struck down possibly by a missile. And he describes a purplish fluid at some point in his original uh, testimony, which I thought was interesting. And the cra he describes the craft kind of in detail. I can pull up a clip of it. That'll take me just one second. Oh, yeah. Thank you. This is great. Um, I'm, I'm like in the process of making a board of similarities and comparing and contrasting stuff. So this is, this is a dream space right now. This rocks. Yeah, I can pull up the original, and I'll, I'll nest the original, um, you know, Dr. Greer interview. But, yeah, he talks about it. And then the interesting thing is, is when he did the second interview um, that he's ever done, more recently, sometime this year, I believe, or possibly late last year, he describes extra stuff that he did not give away in the first interview, that he actually saw the arm of the alien being, um, like, flopped out of the craft, and I feel like we don't talk about that enough. He, he did come uh, What? Yeah. yeah. That's wild. It's like, what color? How many fingers? Oh, my God. I don't remember. I'm going to need to get that clip. If anybody has Hell it, yeah. DM, me, DM me it. Dude, that's big, actually. The craft is crazy, too, though. Wow. I mean, we know that these things, they get dropped. We don't, you know, if we hit them with a missile as an example, sometimes they just fucking fall out of the sky. But we have quite a few of these things, so I totally can buy him running across one of these these deals here. Uh, yeah, so I posted a bunch of clips. We'll play the, the pertinent, the ones that I've shared just for the group. Go ahead, Garrett. I'm curious what you think. Oh, I don't, I don't really have an opinion on it. I, I wanted to ask because I don't really know who Herrera is or Wagant, and I wanted to ask, like, what your opinion was, like, because you're saying that he was talking to uh, Stephen Greer. And Stephen Greer, I don't know about you, but, like, he's not exactly the most trustworthy guy in the world. So, like, I was just kind of, I wanted to kind of hear what you your thoughts were on these individuals and kind of, like, yeah, I just kind of wanted to hear what you thought, like, your personal opinion on the situation was. Because right now I'm at, like, a, one out of ten in terms of like <laughs> believing this just by based off the Greer association alone but well, i don't i'm not trying to diss you at all i just like i'm curious to hear because i've heard this name before but i've never heard him speaking or like um any of his speeches i think it's complicated i think that we all know that there are pieces of probably very real information if you know, let's pretend that both of them are lying for whatever reason. Uh, let's say that they're misinformation. I think that there could be real information in 
what they say, for one, right? Uh, sussing out what might be true and not true is a whole other separate, obviously very difficult task. Um, I also think that everybody's doubts about Greer are fair, uh, given the long, you know, the decades in which he's been involved in ufology. But I think that, um, and I've talked about this too with Eric Davis and Kate Green, like there may have been an era in which they perpetuated dif disinformation, because at that time, they maybe really felt like it was real um, or possibly perpetuated it disingenuously and knew that it was fake. But my prime example of what I'm trying to describe is Kit Green and that email chain with all of the Bigelow guys when he says that he saw photographs of an alien autopsy that looked real to him. This was back in... 99 or 2001? Yes, I'm familiar with that. Okay, well, he retracted that, and he says now that he doesn't think that that was real, that that was actually some kind of test that was given to him. So if you would have, if we would have talked about this a year after those, um, those emails actually occurred in the early 2000s, we could have said that Kit Green is a disinformation agent, or he's full of shit, and then we paint with a broad brush and we believe nothing he says. But if it would have been now, we, we, we have more context, um... So, I don't know. I think the era is important. Getting back to your question, I think the era is important. I think that possibly Greer's efforts early on were very genuine, maybe less ripe for fakery and fuckery. I, I really can't say. But I don't think that it's possible that everybody's lying. All of these whistleblowers that he's brought forward. That would be pretty crazy, I think. Because he's gotten them from to my knowledge, all over the place. I mean, he had a Lockheed guy. He had the guy that, you know, um, Mr. Wolf that has since passed with the base on the backside of the moon. He's got Weygant, who was a Marine in Peru. I mean, these are all walks of life. I don't know. Doesn't it seem presumptuous to just... So, Dove, I, I agree with that, but let me throw this out. If you watch his documentaries... He, after having all, I agree, all these super credentialed people, he has hours and hours of footage on these people. And yet, it, most of his documentaries uh, focus around this woman uh, this, with white hair. You know who I'm talking about? Dr. Carol Rosen. Yeah. Is what he calls I don't, her. And, really? I don't think. And <laughs> quite frankly, I think that that is the most, like, if you look into her, and I've done my research on her through her websites and her sources. And so it says that she has an honorary doctorate from like Nigeria and that she is like, it, Dove, I can DM you. It, it was getting ridiculous. And quite frankly, if anybody like Dr. Eric Davis or Kit Green had been associated with some baloney like this, then the people would never let it go. And it's just like, to me, like, people could take five minutes and look at this. And, but, like, I ask, if he's got all these legitimate people, I do think there's probably legitimate people sprinkled in there. But, like, why is he still parading her around? as Does he being, parade like, her around still? I, I mean, look at his documentaries. Like, it's, it's almost 25 to 50% of the documentaries. But that's, that's my, I'm being a critic. I know that his fans would probably disagree. Um, so I'd be curious to hear what the uh, opposing view to that is. But, yeah, uh, I, think it's I appreciate all, you explaining this. I think it's all good to talk about, you know, like let's get it out there and what everybody thinks because somebody's, one person's hunch can like help catapult another person to realize something or, or whatever. It's all worth conversation um, for the most part, I think. But yeah, I, I think it's, you know, a good idea to be wary and be careful. Um, I think that Ro Carol Rosen's story is so like wild. It's like a it's like a, a hook, right, to get people in, and yank them in, and and reel them in, um, and then maybe he like puts other stuff in there to try and educate people. Who knows? Go ahead, Sarah. Hey, um, I wanted to touch on the disinfo aspect, and um, I'd say I I can totally relate to you and Garrett's point of view. Um, what I like, I know this is kind of a selfish thing to say, but if, if there's, if there's going to be disinfo, right, and we can't really, we can parse out to a pretty good extent who the bad actors could be, right, just based on the Carol Rosin and the, 
the research we do. What interests me about the, the, him platforming people, whether they're real, their stories are real or not, is getting these details like the arm, the color of the fluid, the, the shape, the materials they saw. So I can, at, I can get those small details, cross-reference them with actually like credible cases and well-documented data points, right? To add on or glean something, to find a pattern in a way. Um, that's why I engage with, um, some of these, like maybe be these whistleblowers that Greer has. That's just another way to look at it for me. This is another data point for myself. Yeah, I agree. And there's the concept that people talk about sometimes where let's say it is like a organized intentional disinformation thing. Like I know I've heard that they'll put real information in there. I know I'm kind of repeating myself now, but, um, yeah, but Dove, don't you it also in his documentaries, it's a major part of what he says is that he says that a lot of these names that got brought up that are names that talk about UFOs. He's saying that they're all in on it and they're all trying to trick you as a way to get more money and to like get famous and that like Tom DeLonge doesn't know what he's talking about, but Dr. Greer does. And, that's a huge part of his documentaries. And I feel like it's very, like, strange to... I don't know. I want to hear about this Herrera guy. But in general, I don't think it's even close to equal footing. Or I pirate his, his content. Nice. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't support pirating content. But I think that is kind of funny. I do. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's fair. Absolutely. I hear you. And, and here's the thing. This shit's messy, okay? Y you know, I don't want to get my ass in the middle of some warring faction that I don't have any business in. I think it's interesting. And I think that um, that could be, like, it's all like a, a it's like a shrunken down um, aspect of, of this tension, this ongoing warring factions that we have at different levels within our world our you know our nation our governments our you know intelligence communities our um ufology um uh, whistleblowers like honestly who the fuck knows what's going on i i don't but i i do find this interview interesting so have you listened to her doesn't do people know herrera's general story or do 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 people not know was it a tr3b something like that duff from the triangular no, was no. it a saucer i think it was octagonal shaped oh my god yes you're reminding me now yes and then they were there was large crates right uh possibly transporting live people yeah and I'm drugs. Play, i'll get the clip i'll, I'll pull okay, that cool. up um i have a bunch i want to share um especially about the tail end of the interview i find that fascinating Okay, talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to queue up the, the clip. Cool. I get high, get high, get high, I get high, get high. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hey. Um, yeah, I just tuned in. Um, so are, are you making this space because of the recent uh, interview with, on the Martin Willis uh, podcast UFO with Michael Herrera? Yes, it came out today, right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I only caught part of it, so... Sorry, I know the space has been going for a bit, but were there, like, any juicy nuggets? Oh, you were about to get right He's into it. He's pulling up some clips, Paul. Fuck yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna shut up. Yeah, great time. Sit down. Hey, King or Paul, are you guys fanboys of Greer? Are you neutral, or do you not like him? I, I don't uh, know. Okay, I'm 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 from the outside. Like I I know what Greer has done. I know the outside. I know people who are mad at him because of some bullshit on CT five. But I I'm pretty neutral. I'm I know I look at him the same way I look at Musan. Don't worry about him so much. Look at what he's bringing forward and go off of that. Yeah, I think that's a good approach for for anybody. And there's a lot of bias towards Greer these days. I personally I'm. Uh, kind of on the opposite. I'm kind of uh, against Greer, I guess. You know, I I uh, give I give him a lot of credit for what he did with the Disclosure Project and uh, his documentary. He's taking it kind of far. 
with the so, hating on everyone else thing. He has, and there's just a few things like the moth. You know, the the picture of the, of the interdimensional being that's just actually a moth. And, uh, you know, his, his whole demeanor of being like this victim and his whole conspiracy, I think, is not what I'm about. So, yeah, I, I kind of don't like Greer. I mean, I don't pay for his stuff, so I don't, I, I just, hey, Herrera came from Greer, so he's still doing something right. He's still talking to the right people, so that's the way I take it. I ain't got money to be hanging out with Greer and drinking Chardonnay, but, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to, I, I'm okay with it. Like you say, he's done a lot of things and motherfucker been around a while. So go he's ahead. Done a lot of good, he's done a lot of good, a lot of bad. Sorry. I want to let the, the clip roll, but I just want, I want to say that, uh, that as far as Herrera goes, I am still on the fence and I did catch a little bit of Martin Will, Willis, uh, pod uh, interview that you're about to play. And, there's just something weird about it. I can't explain it. He reminds me of Philip Schneider in terms of his demeanor. He, he's a little bit too serious. But anyway, I'll shut up now and let you play it. Yeah, I don't I don't think he's too serious at all. I, I know he went to Arrow. He did his thing. Like That's more than most whistleblowers have done. So on that alone, he's already gone further than most. So I want to get back to that. You on that. Yeah, because I, I hadn't heard his voice yet, so we'll see. All right. Do you have one, Des? Sorry, if you're still searching. Yeah, I got it. I was just, um, I'm loading up that clip for, of Weigand, but here goes Herrera talking about his experience, and if I have to cut it off, um, if, like, my kid wakes up or whatever, that's what's going on there. So, here we go. It's kind of like they put sticks together with randomized people and uh, just lumped us all together and said, this is your squad, you're going to go with these people, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and that ended up, what ended up happening. So, we ended up loading onto a uh, CH-53E Super Stallion, flew to an airport that was close to the dang city, and then we touched down on the landing pad, or the landing strip there, or the runway, and we ended up flying to a remote area that um, had, didn't have hardly any people in there from what I can recall. They ended up uh, getting off the bird, basically going to this slope or kind of a hill that kind of had observation over the LZ. And uh, we were equipped with a basic combat load, so six magazines. So I had one inserted in M16A4, and we were basically condition four meaning that, uh, or, yeah, condition four, which I just had a magazine inserted in there, so then basically you just had to rack it back. We weren't necessarily there to intimidate or try to fight anybody because we're doing a peacekeeping operation. So we end up going on top of this hill to get better observation of this LZ. We had turned around and kind of, you know, I had a camera with me because this is the first time I've ever been in a, on an actual mission. So I'm taking pictures and videos of the helicopter that, you know, came in and was kind of sitting there and then it took off. And then we went up going up to the hill. So I'm kind of doing my thing again. And we turned to a basically what would be our north direction. And this is where the slope starts to go down. And this is where we saw something kind of moving, but it was like, you know, you had tree and vegetation in the way so you're not able to actually make out what uh, you're actually seeing and uh, I was one out of six with us so there were six marines total and we had M16A4s and uh, we saw this thing starting to change colors we thought it was a building or some kind of shadow effect or whatever it is we didn't think anything of it but we kind of got curious and we basically trekked down and uh, when we got basically about most to 300 meters, I would estimate, because this this what we end up seeing when it started to clear was this craft sitting there, and it wasn't making any kind of you know uh, loud noises. It wasn't doing anything like a jet propulsion or like a helicopter. It's just kind of like a humming noise, something like a transformer or something like a guitar amp. You know, that's the only way I can really describe that. And um, it was sitting there, but it was rotating. And as it was sitting there, it wasn't going like this. It was completely still. And um, it's rotating. It was an octagonal shape. It was about uh, 300 feet is what I estimate because of the helicopters that we have. When you're in a Marine Corps, and Jonathan, you can probably attest to this, that you get very good at judging distances and measurements with how they train us to do it, um, especially in the infantry capacity. So I estimated that I can put three of the helicopters that we flew in on 
underneath this craft, and from nose to tail, it took about three, which each helicopter is roughly about 100 feet from nose to tail. So when we were getting close up to this to basically identify it, which we couldn't identify it because we didn't know what the hell this thing was, we got... We had our weapons basically not even at the low ready, but we're just kind of walking like this. And when these guys approached us, they were already armed. And they already had basically their muzzles on us. So if we're going to raise our stuff up, they've already got us pretty much sighted and ready to go off. And it was so quiet that you could actually hear, hear them flip their safeties off. And they started screaming at us, asking who we are, who are we, who are we with. Um, they basically told us to put our hands up in the air and let our weapons fling down. So they had us, like, if we had a tactical column here, they had us basically like this, a team of four here, a team of four here, and they're basically doing, like, a nosebleed, so they have multiple sectors that they can basically ambush in, us in if need be, getting mu multiple muzzles on one Marine. So they came up to us. They had us basically get online. We're facing straight ahead. They've got two guys searching each one of us. They're taking our magazines out of our pouches and throwing them down, kicking them off. You have a guy in a standoff distance that has his M4 basically pointed right at our faces. And you had one guy that was actually calling the shots that actually had a radio. Um, one of the identifying uh, markers on these people is they had American gear, like American IOTV vests, but brand new. They were black. They had... Um, just the kind of similar setups, but more high speed. They had uh, M4s that had quad rails that had an ACOG on them. We had the RCOs. They had the PEC 16s, which were more of the um, updated version compared to what we had. And um, they were basically saying that they were going to kill us, that they could kill us. They took our IDs out of our breast pocket while we're at gunpoint like this. And um, so these guys obviously knew where we kept our stuff because Marine Corps order states that you have to have your ID in your left breast pocket. So that kind of hinted me that these guys were former military. And um, they had sidearms with the drop plate holsters, and they had no identifying insignias. They didn't have rank. They didn't have anything. They had ball caps, um, which didn't have anything on them either. And um, so when they took our IDs, they had this thing that reminded me of a biometrics uh, system that we were trained on. And they tried to scan our IDs with these things, and uh, it seemed like they were getting frustrated, like they couldn't do it. So they had something that looked like a, a modern-day smartphone, but very thin, that were starting taking pictures of our IDs. So um, they put back in our breast pocket they took our weapons obviously from us and when the way that they checked them because we didn't have a round in the chamber but the way they checked them it told me that they've done this multiple times that this was just something that was so fluid and smooth that they uh they're very well versed in this and this is like their job so they're you know there was no misstep if that makes any sense well so, can i ask you this did, did they have any type of accent do they sound american would you yes. say they, they had american, american dialects yep just like how you and i were talking they weren't australian they weren't eastern european or anything like that they had very you know like how you and i were talking very yeah. aggressive. And, and Jonathan, we'll get into a bit of what you went through, but would you say the same thing with the people that showed up in the black camo and your situation did they also? Okay. So that was a long clip. So we'll, there is a little bit more and I'll play that in a minute, but does, is that helpful, Sarah or anybody in the room? Hell yeah. This is weird. Um, well, interesting. Uh, you, you know, it's been a main minute since I've listened to the, this, uh, this interview he sounded very nervous second time listening to this. I, I wanted this to is say, a new one. This is not. This is a repeat of his. This story. is a new one. Yeah, this just came out today. Damn, it's he still sounds that. nervous then. Yeah. I was gonna say I actually noticed that as well, and I'm not sure. To me, it reads as as I'm observing him visually, and then also listening to it. He's recounting specific details. And if this really happened to him, it's very easy when you're going about, when you're doing that, when you're recounting something that was, obviously that would be traumatic. If some, if a military people came with their guns pointed at you and you just encountered something super strange, um, it's almost, it's not like a flashback, but you get in, like it's a uh, fight or flight type thing. Like you, you get, like your nervous system gets hella activated and sometimes your voice can get shaky. You can feel some type of way. Um, like it just happened. So it could like essentially triggering to, to talk in such yeah. detail about it. Yeah. Um, you could, just, you could just hear it in his voice. Um, and yeah, that's a good point. There's, there's a lot of detail here. He's, uh, he's definitely re relive this in his head quite a bit. It sounds like, um, what happened to him. Uh, I'm curious. Yeah, this is, this is cool. How long is this interview in total? Is it a, is it a couple hours you'd, you'd say? Um, the total interview is an hour and 15 minutes. We're not going to listen to all of it. I do have sure. a couple of other clips. 
So, so Herrera recounts his um, story just like he did, and a lot of it is very similar to what he said w- with Greer um, during the most recent disclosure event. I can't remember what it's called, um, but Wagant is very hesitant. Um, through the majority of this interview, he's invited to tell his story or speak, and he kind of declines multiple times. He's like, I'm not going to go here. Um, but he, he gives the, us a little bit to go off of. He, you know, he goes through the broad strokes of his experience. Um, but what is new for him is he, he told of some of the harassment, I guess, that he had encountered after, I believe it was after he had talked to Greer like he said that this event occurred 25 years ago where a federal like a, a government owned vehicle collided with his parked car at his home and I have that clip to play that's new I've never heard him talk about that before wait um did he come out with this story a couple of years ago because Courtney referenced something today in a tweet saying that somebody's gonna come to light and share their abusive how they were how they were handled abusively um, with their I experience. I don't think that's. I don't think that's who this is. Okay, because it did drop today. This interview, so I just had to double check. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I don't know who, who that's going to be. By the way, I'm very curious. I I know the tweet you're talking about. Yeah, I didn't see that, but I don't believe this would be it. I think that it would be introduced more like clearly that this is you know there. This seemed almost like a. Like he, he said at first he wasn't going to talk about it, but then he, he acquiesced and he, and he did essentially. Go ahead, Pavel. Welcome. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I know this guy, Wygant. Can anybody just like give me a short uh, summary of who he is? He, he was in the group of six people with Herrera when the incident happened? No, no, no. So these are two separate individuals. Um, Michael Herrera's event occurred in 2009, I want to say. Way Gant, um, the guy with the big beard in the interview wearing the black yeah. shirt, his, his um, encounter occurred back in, I believe it was 1996, in Peru. Oh, wow. Yeah. In Peru. And, Yes, in Peru. I did post his original testimony in the comments, um, and he had talked to Dr. Greer um, for the disclosure efforts back in the day. Um, And then he fell off the map for 20 years, basically, for a really long time. And then he he came out about eight months ago, it was, to to the podcast that we're now referring to and did his second ever interview on Podcast UFO. And now today, his essentially third interview ever dropped today. And that is the interview with him, Michael Herrera, and the host. Um, There was another interview today on this case. Did you guys see it? Yeah. I haven't. No, I haven't watched it. And I I, I feel silly now. Maybe I should have watched that before I started the space. But I was just. Well, this guy, Nathan, uh, Patrick interviewed him. And supposedly, Nathan was. Herrera's uh, team leader, and he he contradicts everything Herrera says. Um, Wait, where is that? Where is this podcast? On um, Reddit. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I'm not saying that I'm I, I'm taking a side. I mean, if anything, uh, Patrick has has done interviews with uh, people from all sides, uh, all types of interviews. He's done Sheehan. He just got unblocked by Dr. Nolan, and I think he may be one of his guests soon. So he talks to everybody, and he gets, I mean, he gets a lot of shit. <laughs> his, his podcast is, is called Vetted, after all. But yeah, I found that very interesting that this guy, Nathan, was like really aggressive towards Hurrah. It was. It's really interesting. I, I have to check yeah. that out. That's and messy he, as hell. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a, a mess, right? You know, you've got Stephen Greer with his National Press Club thing that wasn't able to gain nearly as much traction as David Grush, you know, d- despite coming out ar- around the same time. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much, uh, like, 
what what I can intelligently say about Herrera, other than again something about his tone from a purely subjective standpoint, it reminds me of Philip Schneider or one of these uber serious who was actors. really scared, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's he's acting very serious, very scared, um, very. I don't know how to how to phrase it, and I feel equally confused, you know, because I'm not a Philip Schneider fan. I don't write him off entirely, but there's just something weirdly outlandish about his story and kind of about Herrera's. But maybe yeah, M- McCandlish would fall in that category too, right? McCandlish. Do you guys know about his story about the famous ARBs? Yes. Yeah. I don't really, but um, as far as Herrera goes, I don't know. I want to say it was National Press Club. Thank you for saying that, Paul. I couldn't think of what it was called, but um, yes. The day of, the day I watched it, I was going through a little bit of mini ontological shock, hearing you know the major ones all go one after the other. Pavel, you got a mic on, hun. Um, sorry, sorry. And, no, it's okay. And... Uh, you know, especially about the other guy, Heckler, you know, or Hacker, Eric Hacker. His was pretty wild. And I got to say that when Herrera talked at the National Press Club, he included what he essentially heard from somebody else about the fact that there was bodies in these. Um, and I didn't play this clip, the clip yet from this interview, but where he talks about the, uh, like, compartments or whatever it is, those Um, containers that he had seen in the back of the pickup trucks or going into the craft or whatever the details were. When he first did the National Press Club one, he said that somebody had talked to him and said that they had seen those specific types of containers before, like in the past, and he wanted to explain to Herrera what they were because there was some kind of like breathing apparatus. I I don't really know, but there was something that happened to them. (laughs) J-Rod? What? J-Rod. Um... But he said that there was, you know, in the National Press Club one, he said there was bodies in them. And doesn't I think this that... Sound, doesn't this sound a little bit... Sorry, doesn't this sound a little bit like, uh, you know, those reptilian stories? Sorry to interrupt that. No, I mean, I appreciate that. You're, you're right. It does sound... I, like, when I first heard it, it was very sinister sounding. Like, without even... Like, just taking it at face value. Like, if this is true, that is really scary because they're abducting people from... Uh, ravaged country post earthquake. These people are desperate. They're hungry. They their you know lives of and and all of their effects are gone or whatever. And who knows how they you know if it was to be true, how would they round them up? And then where are they taking them? And what are they doing? Like just the implications of such a thing were so sinister and dark in my opinion that that I, I, that really kind of took over for me. And then I've re-listened to the Herrera account like one or two times since then. And I got very suspicious of it for a while when the Joey researcher guy started coming into spaces and talking with us. I I just found it a little strange. Um, And then there, as his story kind of grew, not necessarily what happened in Indonesia that we just listened to in the clip, but this other stuff about deep underground military bases, and um, I don't know. The likelihood of all of those things occurring with one individual, you know, seems a little bit unlikely to me. But I'm not, I'm not in the military. I'm not, you know, I have no basis, um, you know, to base that on. But it's very very sensational, though, right? Yeah, I do agree. Some of it is very sensational. However... Go ahead. Um, did, I'm guessing they didn't ask him about Nathan in that interview. You, you saw it all, right? I don't think they did, unless it was in the, like the last five minutes. Okay. Which, which it could be. So I, I didn't see it. The him asking him about Nathan. Is he the guy? So I pulled up the Nathan interview on Vetted. So he looks young. This guy that's yeah, supposed to be he looks his. Really young. That was strange to me. You want to know yeah, something about like, synchronicities? Because today was kind of weird on that case specifically. Because I saw the, the Vedder interview and then I saw 
uh, an old video from James Yandoli from Engaging the Phenomenon, where he talks about these abductions that were being conducted by the government. And then this dropped. It was kind of strange, all three videos in one day. From different which, do, you, do, you, do you know which interview that was on engaging the phenomenon? It's uh, he retweeted. He's been reposting uh, some older content, though. Yeah. Okay, so it was a repost, it's, it's probably the from a uh, from Inquire Anomalous. No, it's the one that says um, it's from a year ago or something. It's the one that says UFO abductions, and it has an interview, an old interview of Dr. Jacques Vallée, where he talks. Okay. About this, and he has Terry Lovelace on the on the video too, talking about his experience. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I know he's been reposting a bunch of Inquirer anomalous, but he's been been re reposting in general. Yeah. So it's very hard to parse, and I don't know what the truth is. Obviously, I would like to think that you know. Hmm. If he's not being truthful, I don't know what to say. That would be terrible. <laughs> that would suck. That is the thing about, you know, these really intense cases where it's like, if, if they're not lying, man, that they're going all in, you know, like, like what could compel somebody to do that? Just, you know, money or some weird shit. Who knows? Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, so I wanted to touch on, before we move to another clip, just what Paul was saying um, about the vibe, right? You know, with, I, I'm pretty neutral, right? But I do, I do sense a sort of uncanniness with his particular case because the cases where it's highly, like, industrialized, sort of, there's a routine, there's a, there's a militarized element of... Like, a lot of the stories we hear about abductees and experiencers are very, like, strange and very odd. And this 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 gray gave me an apple, and then they tootled away and got in a raft. You know, like, this guy, is, it's very structured, right? They were doing this. They had a job. And you know what I mean? It's, it's uncanny with the, the cases I'm used to hearing. Because the high strangeness, I absolutely, like... Those are the cases, like, the weirder, like, I'm, like, kind of like a J. Allen Hynek sometimes. The weirder it is, the more I'm, like, well, that actually, that could be fucking real, dude. So this guy, it's highly, like, industrialized. It's hard, it's, it's, it's totally different than what I'm used to researching. You know what I mean? I 100% agree. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Yeah, that's, I think that's what so, I was picking up, too. I think that... Whistleblowers slash experiencers or whatever, people that have a story to tell that come from the military are generally, based on what I've seen and based on history, seem to be regarded in a certain light, which is more, I don't know if they're given more credence or their stories are just more um, traceable because they're in the military, maybe. Like there'd be records and hard facts that they can point to. Like I was here on this day. Here's my DD whatever form. Um... You know, all of these things. So I think that maybe that is why um, there is an industrialized vibe to somebody like Herrera's story, just in general. Um, I'm not saying it's negative, though. Absolutely. It's just different, you know? It's worth, worth talking about, worth discussing. That's valid. And I think that that could be because he's a military dude. So maybe that's just his approach in general. Like, he's just a facts-driven guy. And if there was some, like, super high strangeness, anomalous, what have you, um, maybe he would, would be less likely to talk about it. Exactly like Wagant. Because Wagant didn't disclose that he saw the being's arm, which I do have that clip, we'll listen to that in a second. Um, but he didn't say that he saw that being's arm in the first Dr. Greer interview. He said that eight months ago on the podcast, and that he does talk a little bit um, about why they decided to admit it. Because it was super... I mean, that's a, a wild thing. It's not an apple in a raft, but it's, you know, for a military guy to say that he saw an alien's arm hanging out of a craft, that is pretty uh, absurd or whatever. Um, so he did admit that. And now he made that up. It. I made myself laugh. Because <laughs> it's totally they would go on a raft and was give you an apple and or a pancake. <laughs> it's just hilarious. 
Somebody <laughs> should read what I posted in the nest. I look yeah. for it. I did not see it pop up yet. Neuro neuro linguistic programming, all that. Wait. You think that's real? How would that work? Like, like hypnotizing you with words? That's what they're saying for your subconscious? That type of shit? I have no idea, man. That's uh, what it sounded like. Yeah. Neuro-linguistic? It's like programming your brain with words? Well, yeah, that, that is the idea. I'm not an expert on it, though. I just I'm, to Go ahead. I'm, I, I'm searching. I think... Humans have reverse engineered something that gives these people maybe the ability to be like uh, super remote viewers, for lack of a better word, that they can make you hear and see what they want. And that is used against people that find out about this program so they can have experiences that discredit that factual stuff they say. Mm, it's kind of like... Uh... I forget who it was that was saying, or, or uh, it was uh, Dr. Dana Walsh Basilka. Uh, she heard that there are, that there's a hierarchy of the NHI, and then I guess uh, intelligence community people that are in contact with the NHI, and then regular intelligence community people, and then uh, a couple of tiers below that. It's almost like um, I don't know that some of these. NHI abilities might be getting used against us, you know, the, this kind of thing where uh, I feel like it's, it's an eternal hall of mirrors, right? If we take into account the possibility that neuro-linguistic programming or other kind of mind control techniques could be a part of the phenomenon, it just makes you question everything. Then It's like, well, how can we possibly know anything at all and uh i think that really that that can be weaponized on the regular populace like us but it can, it can also be weaponized on um the powers that be you know like the the people within the program by by the nhi it's where you know we, we can't even know but we can't distinguish what's going on. It's that, that bi-directional mimicry that Colin Kelleher talks about. Anyway, he just threw my brain down a rabbit hole. I was going to say something else. Dude, uh, yes. Um, Christopher, go ahead, and then I'm going to play this um, Weygant clip from the eight months ago where he talks about the alien arm. Hi, thanks, Dove. Thanks for hosting this. I'm really excited to be in, in this space. Um... Uh, I think it's uh, incredibly important in this field to be aware of um, our neurological weapons that that are in development or, well, that already exist and have for a really long time. Um, uh, so... Um, you know, we've we've possessed voice to skull technology to be able to plan a voice in someone's head from a long distance since the '70s or the late '60s. You can find patents for this stuff. Um, uh, yeah, the the brain is very hackable, and uh, you know, just to I think this lends some credence to Herrera's story. If you're, I don't know if you guys are familiar with MK Ultra and the history of <laughs> our government experimenting on mind control through um, basically torturing people to create uh, dissociative identity, multi-personality disorder. Um, that's what that's I was a, referring to for sure. Yeah, that's a real thing. Um, and it's, <laughs> we, you know, it's, it, it can't have gotten less advanced in the 50 years since they were doing that, you know? Um, and so I think that type of stuff, uh, you know, it, it, we've had people willing to do these terrible things, <laughs> and I don't see why they would have quit if they're having success, you know. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get get people um, for your secret programs. Well, I mean, disaster zones and, and war-torn areas and, and open borders seem like perfect place to do it. Um and I just want to point out also that sort of something like this uh, 
Tom DeLonge has in Secret Machines. It's not exactly like kidnapping, but it's like, you know, you've got these... Uh, it, it, he didn't come right out and say it either. It, I think it would be in the third novel that this would fully be developed, but the pilots, uh, there's already this indication that they were being sort of experimented on and tested as children and set aside for their unique abilities for, you know, probably developing their psychic abilities or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think all that stuff is, is going to be relevant to these topics and uh, the, just on point with what uh, King posted up there with John Alexander. Uh, by the way, I don't know if anyone saw Hellier. Did anyone watch the series Hellier? Um, Good stuff. Uh, yeah, recommended from R UFO Rabbit Hole is how I came across that. But uh, in that show, they they do a, a hypnotic regression on a guy who's never had a UFO encounter, and he becomes, they, they do a, a, what I would call an unethical hypnotic regression, plant the idea. They basically did an inception on him, and he totally came, it, it became a part of his identity, you know? Alleg allegedly. I, I want to, I, I think that everyone should take a gigantic grain of salt when it comes to Hellier. We could do an entire space, multiple spaces about them. But uh, that's that's not to say that that hypnosis can't be used to, to implant false memories. It absolutely can. But yeah, I just wanted to say that. Was that season two? Because I don't remember that in season one. It was just was digging season, around in the woods. That was season one, I think. It was yeah. The what the hell? Part. I must have missed that episode, guys, because I thought they were just talking to a ghost box. I thought that was <laughs> <laughs> that was the good part. But was the ghost box and all of the maybe the I fell asleep. Shit. It, it got really weird, and and you know, then they contacted the woman that was like the daughter of the uh, injured Cole guy, and and a whole bunch of really hokey. I shit. like injured Cole. I don't even care if they made it up. He's my he's real to me now. Okay, Paul. Me too. Can't take him away. <laughs> he's my I'm man. Just, I'm just saying, I love Hellier, but it gets it gets cringy. Nonetheless, I, I do recommend it as well. Sorry. I, well, you're that. good. Duff has one more clip loaded up, but before we. We get on to that. I wanted to say one thing to King, if that's okay, Dev. Um, that think about it this way: people who are prone to neurolinguistic tamperings, there's certain keywords, right? We have those. There's, it's very complex. We're we're betting here. So, imagine this: people in this space right now could be linguistically programmed to respond to certain different words to initiate different things in their psyche. What, think of downloads, think of things like that. Just a thought. It could be what, turned to you know a different have any, like, What would be like an example of something like that? Like the actual God. word. It, it, could, be, have a whole it could be individualized. You know, like like what if, what if, candidate? What if, what if it's individualized to the sense of, you could say potato, but then you remember that when you were at your grandfather's potato farm, you remember seeing that weird thing in the sky, right? It has to be said a certain way, right? The word, the so word who be, knows? It would be something like op or whistleblower or something else that Red Panda says. I'm just saying, it could initiate also the remembrance of things that were repressed uh, that will further you along in the mystery schools. I mean, it could be a anyway, backwards and forwards. Banana. All right, I'm going to play the clip, but circling back to something that Garrett talked about, Carol Rosen or Rosen or whatever, and the Greer and her testimony about the fucking Nazi guy. Um, You're talking about Project Project Blue Beam, right? No, I don't know. She was okay. talking about how there's space weapons and they're going to run out space. Werner von Braun. You Werner are talking about Braun. Project Blue. Yeah, yeah. Sarah Rosen, she's the primary okay. source on that. Anyway, sorry. When she tells that story, I just got, it was like probably the third time I listened to it. I'm like, I feel like she is trying to implant something in my brain because she repeated it so many times in her testimony over and over and over and over and over and it was weird so that's what I have to say um, I'm going to play this clip and what we're going to be listening to is from eight months ago it's this it's the podcast UFO and this is uh, Wagant talking about the alien arm that he saw um, and he'll tell his story, but this was not included in his original Dr. Greer testimony, the OG one. So this was that. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Turn it and up. when you come up to something like this, do you think right away, I mean, I'm just trying to picture the whole thing. Do you think, like, uh, there's someone in there, are they okay? Yeah, there was, there was uh, like I said, I think they were, like I said, I, I, I thought there were two creatures inside of the vehicle. Or what I call creatures, I don't know what they are. And, uh, but uh, what about, did you see any, you saw some part of... Yeah, one, one of the creatures was, his uh, arm and hand was hanging out. He, he was hanging out. Did it come out, was it hanging out when you walked up to it? Or was yeah, it he was hanging out, probably dying. I don't know about the other pilot. I don't know what they were, to be honest with you, but I guess you could call them aliens or whatever. I guess that would be... Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and uh, one of them was, I think he was dying almost, or close to death, right, yeah. from the crash. So, but I, like I said, I, I, this, is, yeah. this is what I thought at the time. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, there is there's a case. I'm not, I know you... I know you're not you're not into like looking into the UFO topic per se, but there is a case in South America, mm. the Virginia case, where there was some beings, and, uh, and uh, one of the the military people supposedly handled, picked up and carried, and then two weeks later he died. Mm. So I mean, uh, and he was in really good health. But I do remember that you said you felt like you could. I know. You well, I think they were trying to project their thoughts into my mind, but it, like I said, I mean, from the traumatic experience, you know, I just don't know at this point. Yeah, but when you think back on it, I try not to. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah, that's 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 a good point, um, and and fair enough. So all this is happening. You're, you, are do you, do you, are you having a conversation on you know what do we do here? Anything like that come up, or I mean, what about the people that were held back? Were they? Were you communicating yeah, right. with them? Like I said, you know, I, there was a lot of commotion, a lot of people running around, and all that stuff. You know. um, and a normal situation like this, if you were what you were trained to do, just let's just say that was a friendly aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the first thing you do is look for survivors. Is that right? Yeah, you know, you know, first aid and all that. And yeah. Typically, they would fly helicopters in and pick the aircraft up if there's anything left of it. You know, the recovery of the, of the pilots and all of this, right? Yeah. All right. So that's most of. He, he doesn't say a ton, but he says he saw the alien arm, and I wanted to highlight that because that's the different. You know, that's the differentiation between the original one. Uh, there could be more, but that's the main one in my eyes. Um, and his testimony, you know, recently. So, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to drop down a little bit and come back. Go ahead, it's, Paul. It's theatrical, right? Just the arm hanging out. I don't really have anything else to add. It's just a funny little detail. It's something that seems to try to grab the listener's attention. Not to say that it debunks it by any means. I... I have no idea, ultimately, but again, it reminds me of, you know, the, the theatricality of, of Philip Schneider's case, where it's like, you know, and then the, the alien touched his his belt, and a laser shot out and hit me in the arm, and then he holds, holds up his hand, you know, I lost three of my fingers. There's just something theatrical about that. You know, Paul, I haven't listened to his full thing, but... I kind of dig this guy's vibe, just based off that clip. Um, I haven't, again, I'm a layman when it comes to his case, but that one clip, I don't know, it sounds kind of weird. I like the weird stuff. It is theatrical, I give you that, but there's something about his tone and his cadence. It really sounds like he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> um, do you know what I mean? Either he's a fucking great actor, I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I was, I'm a little more impressed with his, his dialogue and his kind of, I don't know. I, 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 I'm taking more in what he says than maybe Michael. Not in a negative way, but something about his vibe. I'm not sure. It's a little different for me. I guess he, he reminds me of, of Michael's vibe, and I think I just have some kind of bias. For some reason, whenever people talk really seriously about this stuff, and they don't seem really, uh, I don't know. I, don't I am know. taking it serious, actually. Finish your thought. They don't seem what, exactly? This is worth talking about, I think. I guess, 
it's purely subjective. I really don't have a, a leg to stand on. But for me, when people seem really uh, like kind of embarrassed and um, what's the word? Uh, I, I don't even know when 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 they just seem like they. I, in other words, I don't really get the vibe that he doesn't want to be there. I guess I don't. I don't feel what you're describing, Sarah. To me, it seems like he kind of does want to be there, and he's just like reading off of a script or something. It, it doesn't I, seem like it's naturally coming to mind. I don't. I, I don't catch that sort of a uh, self. What's it called? Self editing that you usually get when you're recalling a memory. It's. It really. It really feels ultra serious you could you could attribute that to military history but nonetheless uh i hear you i think that's worth consideration i just wanted to point out that history um in my opinion the fact that he has given testimony three times in total over the period of what 25 years um tells me that it could be true that he doesn't want to be there he doesn't have an interest in the ufo phenomenon he doesn't speculate about what they could be and if he wanted to, he really could. He could spin a whole bunch of different stuff, but he's not doing that. That's true. And, and, he, and he also, says, he's, he's not really uh, crafting a narrative as much as Herrera is, which is why I would say I would put Wigand above Herrera, because there's not this whole kind of human trafficking, uh, humans running UFOs narrative to the same extent. Sure. I, I, um, I think it was a mistake for Herrera to talk about that, because that's not firsthand he didn't experience that that was something that he was told by somebody um who possibly knew what was in the cases or the containers he didn't actually see any humans but then when he talks about the dumbs and the deep underground military bases and you know what could be going on there while i do find some of that plausible i don't know if i believe herrera um just the nature of um people in a struggle that are uh suffering and that are desperate for um, some kind of help or assistance that they could be manipulated into to some weirdness. You know, I find that plausible. But anyways, Herrera didn't speak to anybody about any of this for a long, long time. If he wanted to, he could have, but he didn't. And if he, uh, so, so to me, that um, regardless of his conduct and his, you know, the way he seems in the interview, he seems like a harsh, brash, um, stoic kind of man, in my opinion, definitely military you know that's believable and uh you know a marine like a tough dude um that normally just shoulders everything and doesn't talk about it that much and so maybe this is weird for him go ahead nathan nathaniel sorry that's all right um so uh i know that uh greer was discussed and i was a controversial figure but i had um heard uh something that came out recently um and uh, there was a part of it that I think relates to this. I had queued up the audio. If it was of interest, I could play uh, the uh, minute or two. Sure, go ahead. All right, one second. Because, <laughs> like, if you do this, you know, here, because here's what's going on at these black sites, right? And how they operate and, and how they train these people. Hmm. So it's sort of like a weaponized version of CE5 contact, which is very sad, actually. It's scary. It's very scary and very sad. Well, they're killing all these innocent AT people also. You know, uh, uh There's uh, some more details about, like, the rogue programs that I'm going through and trying to clip together and get, like, the nature of this um, element that I think Herrera's testimony is proving, so. That's interesting. Are you still talking, by the way, Nathan? Okay. No, I, I uh, landed the jet. Cool. Uh, I was just making sure, but Paul and Duff, I think it. I like. I like the. Uh, I like the discourse we had about the. We're kind of armchair psychologists again. I'm not like some sort of person who analyzes people's voices and stuff. I don't know how to fucking do that. But it's just my vibe. But I do like to hear other people's vibes. You know, like what they pick up. I think it's super interesting. Absolutely. I'm just posting the, um, I'm going to share the vetted, I'm just getting a link to the vetted podcast just for good measure to share it in the comments. I haven't yeah. watched uh, Thanks, Deb. Uh, Nathan, what, what was that clip from? 
Okay, yeah, so um, that is on YouTube. Uh, hey, I'm here. Uh, sorry, I was actually, that was a weak one. That was just like a second, um, but there's more, and it directly relates to Herrera. Um, I was just trying to find it if this was, um, you know, that kind of space where just uh, just wanted to share in the nature of this. It's called um, on YouTube, uh, Breaking News, exclamation mark, Rogue Black Budget Programs. That will shock you, exclamation mark, 2024. Um, but really, I think he does a good job of giving the dark architecture of things. I think it's, I think it's real. So, okay, thank you. Um, and the, and then the only thing I wanted to add is uh, I have heard. I'll just say I've I've heard from John Ramirez that at least he uh, backs Herrera. I haven't talked to him about Wigan, but for whatever that's worth. Real quick, Dove, and the, can I just ask her where where was Wigan's first? interview when when and where did that appear um i did post it in the comments i don't know where they were physically located uh but it's like where do you where did it air for the first time like was are you asking if it was yeah yeah happening? yeah where, what, how did we know about it that's what i mean where, where can i watch it it's in the comments of this okay. of this thing it's it says original wigand interview and this leads back to um, the serious disclosure effort with Dr. Greer. Yeah, it was it was from Greer about what twelve or thirteen years ago. Uh, so that one was. This wasn't part of the original Press Club two thousand one. No, nah. right? I, oh yeah, maybe it's not. I'm getting all my deck. I'm too old. No, he, he had so two. He, he had uh, <laughs> Greer, Greer had two big events. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was the latter one, which was uh twenty. 13, 2012, thereabouts. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one yet. I'll have to check that out. Thanks, guys. I did think it was older, but yeah, I forgot that there was the one in 2013, too, so it could be from that one. It yeah, you could, you could be right, too. Oh, you're not old. Well, I'm just like, there was one in 2001, which I was alive for, and, you know, whatever. A lot of disclosure efforts over the decades. I think you just have too much info in your file cabinets up there. You yeah. have to shuffle through them. All right. Now, so, uh, go ahead. I just want to say, um, I have a minute and a half. Uh, I'll set that card down. You can play it whenever you want, um, if uh, it's of interest. Sure. Um, I'm just looking at the other things, that the clips, because I shared a couple of clips. Okay. Oh, yeah. Does anybody want to hear Wigand in the federal government-owned vehicle hitting his car? This is interesting and new. Did I play this already? No. No, I'm good. All right, here we go. Probably, essentially. And I, I, I had, I had um, what appeared to be a, um, a federal agency vehicle car uh, turn into when I, when I lived at my grandmother's. Um, we had a disappearing driveway, essentially, and I, I was parked a little bit further back than I should have. And uh, a government car pulled in and hit me. I guess they were trying to turn around. I don't know what they were doing, but they left their, their front bumper and uh, their, uh, the, the, uh, the government plate that they had on the front of it, on the bumper itself, and it tore off and they left it. And uh, this has been years ago, several years ago, a long time, about 25 years ago. And so, and uh, I filed a police report. I'm going to get the, I'm going to obtain the police report at some point. And, uh, but uh, anyhow, the, uh, I, I, I traced it. Well, they did. The, the, the local police, uh, the Graham police, traced it to uh, to a uh, uh, the federal government. That's how I knew. Well, I mean, anyway. So that's how I knew that. But uh, this this has been years ago. But I, but I mean, the guy that showed up and knocked at the door. Are you able? To yeah, know? yeah. Just uh, yeah. I, well, can we go? Can we go into it later? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's the gist of it. And he does say. So right before this part. He was hesitant to talk about it because he was prompted to talk about this by the host. And he was like, I don't really want to talk about it because I, I believe it seems like that was because he did not have the police report that he references in the clip. But now he says in the clip that he's going to obtain that. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see if he does obtain that police report. What does it say? Does it check out? What's the time? You know. That's something that can be like semi substantiated and like when did it happen? And um, I just thought that was interesting. I've never heard him talk about that before, so that seems new. 
Makes me nervous, Dove, if he's talking about it in the interview. They'll just fucking burn it if he hasn't gotten it yet. They're going to hear that interview. Oh, damn. <laughs> I don't know. You're not supposed to spill that card yet, man. Come on, wait, well, wait, Gant. Uh, but hopefully they don't follow this niche YouTube account. Um, and it'll all be well and he'll get it, no problem. I'll put that out there. And then, um... You forgot all the CIA people that are listening to us right now. Oh, fuck. It's so Damn it. <laughs> good, good, good point, King. I guess maybe I was talking to all the feds. Dude, I remember, uh, I can tell a very quick story. When I was at Contact in the Desert last year, I had dinner with, uh, at this uh, awards dinner, I, I was with John Ramirez, as well as Andrew Gallimore and a few other people, and I stepped away at one point, and then John was, was uh, chatting up, ch chatting it up with some guy that ha happened to be at our table, and I got back, and he was like, Paul, like... So funny. This guy's also he, this guy's also a CIA guy, and we were just talking shop, and then I'm just listening to these guys talking CIA, and you would just never know. It's just this this completely random guy, you know. He wasn't a, a speaker or anybody. He was just somebody present at Contact in the Desert, completely unassuming, and he was just in the CIA. I don't know. Hold on. So, motherfuckers from the CIA hang out at Contact in the Desert. Dude, and well, go there to do what exactly? Who the fuck well, knows, man? Situation and see what what people know. That makes sense. There's that's probably why I, that's tons why of I, them there. There's probably aliens there. That's that's why I really would doubt going to one of those things, son. Because I'm gonna learn some shit or find out somebody's a cop and be like, "Yo, this motherfucker's a cop!" Start screaming, "CIA, <laughs> CIA, get this motherfucker out of here!" That's kind of what it was like, <laughs> you know, at this dinner table talking to this guy, and, and then and then John le leans over to me. He's like, "Yeah, this guy's in the CIA." I was like, "Damn, man!" But yeah, dude, I I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are actual you know alien people walking among us at some of these events i've heard some stories i i could go deeper but uh i won't but i will say this that when i was at contact as well last year uh i don't think this person was actually an alien but i was walking around the bar at one point at the resort and there was this guy who's the tallest person i have ever seen in my life he was seven, easily like seven feet tall six ten six eleven or something he had uh silver white hair he wasn't he didn't look like a nordic or something but he was just insanely tall and silver haired and you know skinny and stuff and i just remember being so stunned i'm like who the fuck is this guy <laughs> i don't know it was really weird you know if i was no. an alien and I wanted to hang out with people. I probably would hang out with the UFO people. I'm not going to lie. Well, I would have asked him, Paul. I, <laughs> uh, I wanted to. I was I was honestly stunned. I, I, I genuinely, I just sat there. I think I, I texted one of my friends. I was like, dude, I just saw this insanely tall guy. I was like looking around to see if anyone else was looking at him. But it was just me. He, he just pressed right past me. I was like, you know, I've this? heard. I've heard that there's certain words that you can say that would trigger like uh like people that are like hybrids or, or like aliens or like that. And when you say certain words, they got to answer you or some shit like that. And I was just thinking about what I had posted earlier with the mind thing. What if there's some type of situation like that? That's how they that's how the government people know. Like, is, I don't know, a noise or something that they have to react to. And they'd be like, all right, that's the motherfucker right there. You mean a code word? It could be a cold word, it could be a sound, it could be going somewhere and putting a certain type of perfume on it and it sets them off some type of way and you're like, okay, this don't work. It's kind of dog whistle. Or it's an Make alien rumor to embarrass us humans. Yeah. Oh, so that losers, no. Um, yeah, but I have no filter, Paul, so I think it's good that you took the polite route because you never know maybe maybe he hates that question and he would have really been offended so that's exactly what i was thinking i was like dude somebody must have been asking him like come on so you're at contact in the desert you're a million feet tall what's the deal <laughs> it was, it was do you really know 
before, I don't want to change subjects too much, but you did say that you might have met a humanoid or you had a humanoid story, story, but you don't want to get into it. Is it like a secret story or what? Uh, it's just somebody else's story. Uh, it's, uh, but I've just, cool. I've just heard that, you know, that, that th there are stories of, you know, um, the be beings walking among us and, um, I've heard some of those and, th and that's, that's all I'm going to say. Fair enough, man. Thanks. Yeah, the Dolan one of the girl in the church is pretty wild when she observes that couple. That's crazy. I love that story. And you know, Dove, did you think back to about all the like extremely hot people you've just been gobsmacked by in the past? I was like, God damn. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's happened to me a handful of times. So now I'm thinking, like, what the fucking hybrids or something? Because they were, like, abnormally beautiful, those types. You know what I mean? Or maybe it's my preference? I don't know, man. I have heard that they're very beautiful, the tall, or, which ones is it? Um, the Pleiadians or something like that? I don't know, some of them are hot. Call them. All, all the names are offensive. <laughs> Nordics, Pleiadians, it, it all sounds offensive to me. Tall whites. It's, it is very weird. It's all, like, white people stuff. I went to Atlanta and I saw the most beautiful black ladies ever. And I'm like, they're mermaids or something. I mean, come on. The Lord, they have, you, have you have they seen like models from Kenya before? Like the, the hottest people on earth. Those are your hybrids, not these tall whites. There is something really weird about it, and it does, in some way, lend credence to some of the you know Nazi folklore that the, that you know the the uh, the occult. Not, nothing against the occult, but like you know certain occult members of of that of the Nazi freaking party that they might have been in contact with with what we know as as the nordics or whatever it it's it sort of lines up it doesn't make it any less problematic or disturbing or like uncomfortable to talk about but yeah hey man if it's like if it's verifiably true like any of that that shit then maybe we have a little linkage to the crazy racist freaks running around you know like what they're sitting on like, they have some deep, dark past and alien stuff. I mean, what can we throw out of it? We can't throw it all out if it's if there's actual verifiable proof of this yeah. shit. I don't know. It's and hard. It's a tough and pill. I agree. And, and we can't throw out stuff just because it's uncomfortable. Honestly, I think that some of the most uncomfortable topics like that, you know, are, are worth looking at. Yeah, and it's, it's awkward to talk about it, too, you know? To be honest, those are my favorite stories. I hear ya. They're pretty. They're pretty uh, taboo and ooh, a little sketchy, but um, they are interesting to discuss. But I won't get into the weeds myself. Ish, what's up? I was gonna say I might have a taboo space so I can hear all these juicy stories. You should. What's up, guys? I've had my first kind of full day off in like a month. I've done absolutely nothing other than going to the gym, and it's been wonderful. I really needed this, and I'm glad to see everyone here. This thing you just mentioned about uncomfortable conversations, I think it's very important. Because in every arena of life, be that, you know, personal intimacy or politics or, you know, fraught business situations, UFOs, whatever, it's often, you know, those uncomfortable conversations which are, the most important, isn't it? Because we can sit around shooting the shit, you know, being cordial and just having these feel good conversations, but it's where that contention exists. There's a reason that exists there. And so to that end, one thing I wanted to say, something I've been reflecting on a lot today, I might've mentioned a few times, but I feel like in human intellectual kind of discourse, everything's really a game and there's two kinds of games, right? You have truth games and power games. It's a really important concept. So like in a truth game, you're actually engaging discourse to determine what is actually true. And ideally, people are engaging it in good faith, right? But then in a power game, you're not really as much concerned with the truth. You're concerned with establishing your position, the supremacy of your point of view over someone else's point of view. And the truth takes a backseat to whatever the agenda of each respective party is. So you guys kind of see how these two different kind of paradigms lead to completely different flows of conversation and ultimately uh, what we arrive upon through our interactions. I think it's very important. Make a point there, Ish. 
Um, you know what would make me more comfortable? Um, you know, who cares about my comfort? I know, right? That's a silly thing to say, but I would, you know what, make me take it a little seriously, a bit more seriously? I need some, like, genealogy. I need some, like, actual, like, maybe physical proof that there's some sort of hierarchy or these races existing for myself. I need, like, other than anecdotal, like, I need some, a little more than that myself. I'm not saying people don't see them, but is that their real form? Are they lying, right? Is it, is it a control system to spread evil thoughts to Lush? I don't know, right? So I need some, like, genealogy tests. I need some ancient docs. I need some doctors. I need all sorts of shit. I need to talk to one of these motherfuckers, right? Or, so, or you, like, you know, maybe just some, uh, some, some data points which follow the same pattern, right? That, that's what kind of freaks me out about Michael Herrera. Like, all of a sudden, he's injected... Uh, into the lore, this idea, not, not that it's entirely new, but he's injected into the lore, this idea of, uh, of human trafficking or dr drug trafficking or, or whatever, human organs uh, trafficking uh, via UFOs on top of the other kind of elements that, that he's contributing to, you know, like uh, obviously humans having reverse engineered this stuff and so forth. Um, it, uh, uh, kind of lost my train of thought, but it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, maybe somebody can pick it up. <laughs> it's just for I'll, 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 you. Pick, I'll pick it up right there. You know, what's interesting is, Sarah, I agree with you. Who can you trust? Someone says that, you know, tall grays and this and whatever the hell. I know, that's no, the problem. No, this ties directly to what I was saying about truth games and power games. I think we need to recognize that in this UFO field, Every single person, whether they admit it or not, has some agenda. It could be a good agenda or a bad agenda. But I, I mean, everybody, especially people who have like some, you know, uh, mass, right? They're, they're, they have something, whether it be a financial interest or a political interest, or maybe even some occult interest. Who knows? There's something there. But, you know, the point I want to raise is, I've talked about this before, but the idea of a philosophical zombie, which is the idea that if you met someone, right, they look like a human, they talk like a human, but they actually don't have any consciousness, okay? They're just a zombie inside. How would you be able to tell if they're actually a human or if they don't have consciousness or not? The reason I say this is I, from my point of view, my perspective, I fundamentally believe that the NHI, I don't discount that there are physical aliens somewhere out there coming in from uh, Zeta Reticulon or whatever, whatever, but I think fundamentally it's uh, it's uh, states of consciousness. They're non Phys well, not non-physical, but just a different type of physicality than we know. You know, I've always thought it interesting that the gray aliens, okay? Just think about it. Like, isn't that very anthropomorphic? What if they don't even recognize what consciousness, the way we... Wait, 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 wait. Who was just talking? My app is glitching. Was that Ish? Who was just talking? Yeah. That was Ish? Okay. Um, about the phil philosophical zombie thing. Um, and, and I'll, I'll get to you, or we'll get to you, King. Uh, it's a good question, but the philosophical zombie thing, I think, should probably be uh, explicated for anyone who's not aware. A philosophical zombie is the idea that could there be... It's kind of like what we're coming up against these days with artificial intelligence uh, passing the Turing test to where we can't tell... Or, or at least reaching a stage where we can't potentially tell artificial intelligence from real intelligence. So a, philosoph a philosophical zombie is something that seems to be, by all accounts, intelligent and sentient, but for whatever reason just is not. You know, in other words, it's like a, an android, but it's not sentient, even though it seems to be sentient. And uh, I just think that's a really important point when it comes to these questions about grays, about the soul, about uh, what might be going on here. You know, there's all these ideas like um, the grays are jealous of our connection to source. They're jealous of our, you know, essentially of, of our sentience. In other words, it's like, you know, the, the lights are on, but nobody's home. You know, they are intelligent, but they don't, they don't have what's, what's known as qualia, uh, Q-U-A-L-I-A, which is the, the subjective qualitative experience of, uh, of experiencing anything. It's like the isness of being. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I could ramble well, on about Paul, this, but there's, there's something there. Dude, the point I'm trying to drive at is 
not that the lights are on, but no one's home, but the lights are on in someone's home, but it's not who you think it is. That's the point I'm trying to get at. Because when we talk about different alien races, imagine hypothetically if a different form of consciousness could inhabit a human body. So it's can I, can, I, can I explain this to you from somebody who's borderline sociopathic? Yeah, go for it. From somebody who is a philosophical zombie? Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, borderline, because I, I, I can turn it off. I, I put it like this. The problem is that those people don't care about what you care about. From that side of the fence, we understand how society is. We understand everybody's being fake. We just know who we are in the inside. And we know that the only way to get ahead comfortably, you're going to have to fuck somebody over. Most people in that area won't harm people, but there are those that say, that are psychopathic, that say, eh, fuck the rules, eh, fuck them. He doesn't matter, he's in my way. And that's where you get into the problem where you start turning people into objects. Okay. But at, yeah. can we, can, Paul, can you just repeat in a nutshell, what is a philosophical zombie? I know you just talked about it, but yeah. just at its base. Um. I guess uh, you could call it like an NPC uh, for anyone familiar with video games. I'm just gonna read. I just googled that the other day. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just I just googled it myself. Uh, philosophical zombie. Let's see what the definition is. Um, concept of a philosophical zombie: a hypothetical being that is physically indistinguishable from a human being, but lacks subjective experience or consciousness. So it's it's kind of like a, a solipsistic concept, you know, like like the idea that 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 other and that that other people are not real, essentially that they're NPCs, or at least that some people are NPCs. Does that make sense? Well, well, Paul, the main thing with the philosophical zombie is is that it highlights how difficult consciousness really is to understand because exactly. consciousness exists internally from like a subjective point of view. So someone could look completely like a human, but they don't have consciousness. How the hell would you ever know? You can't actually put machines in someone's brain. And well, but when you mean brain. consciousness, do you mean like the ability to tell right from wrong or to feel bad about what they're doing to people or consciousness like somebody's actually conscious? Because well, there's two different kinds of consciousness. You yeah, can get con not consciousness some in the sense of having qualia, which Paul described, which is subjective experience. So, like, you know, everyone in this room is feeling something at this moment. You're getting all these streams of information. You know who you are. You have awareness. You know, that subjective experience of being alive in the moment and, you know, feeling that, essentially. Well, I don't know. I think, I think, I think everybody feels emotions they just find different ways to feel it like yeah somebody... but Wakata, that's not the point the point is a philosoph a philosophical zombie would not have any of that internal stuff going on whatsoever it's not about having a different degree of it there's no one home but how are you is there an home? example of somebody that's in the uh, that's a phys philosophical zombie no that's why it's called the philosophical zombie it's 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 it's, it's the thought experiment but oh, look, okay, he, okay. here's what i want okay. to say is, i got you I, no i got it now i got you yeah yeah I, I, when we talk about hybrids okay do you imagine that a hybrid would literally be like half lizard half human and walk around like some freaking halloween costume looking all crazy or could it be possible that a hybrid looks like a human with just very subtle differences but internally in terms of consciousness it's something that's not human do you get what i'm saying yeah like they just look human on the outside yes right? yeah. Yeah. So like is, is the human the human body is a container and they're putting their consciousness in the human body Right. Well, or, or you can look at it this way: it, it, the difference between intelligence and sentience. Right. So, um, th this might not be a, a perfect a perfect explanation of what qualia is, but when we think of, uh, for example, animals, right? Uh, animals are intelligent to varying different degrees, uh, and you know they are communicative. They they have all sorts of different abilities. But are they sentient like we are? I, I think most most of us would agree not. So it's just it's just that idea that that you know could there be philosophically? It's just a thought experiment. Other entities like humans that appear to be uh, you know intelligent by all means, but they're not 
sentient in the way that we are. They're not self-reflective. Here, let me share something with you guys. Short, simple, sweet, and it drives the point home completely. It's called Mary's Room. So imagine that there lives a brilliant neuroscientist named Mary in a room. The peculiarity of the room is that it's completely black and white in color. No color exists in this room. Not just the room, but everything inside as well. The walls, the furniture, everything is black and white. Even the computer screen shows only these two colors. However, even though Mary hadn't herself experienced color, she knew everything there was to know about them. She knew about cones and rods and how light travels from retina to the occipital lobe through the optic nerve. She also knew about the variations in frequency and wavelengths that made up different colors. In total, she was an expert in colors without ever having experienced colors. One day, her computer screen malfunctioned and it showed her an apple that is red in color. Now remember, Mary already knows everything about the physics and biology of colors. Do you think consciously experiencing it herself adds anything to her knowledge of colors? Do you understand the point about how it's, there's a difference between knowing all the facts and theories about something and then actually, as a consciousness, experiencing that thing? So what do you guys think? I'll, I'll leave that out for discussion. But would seeing red for the first time add something to her experience beyond knowing all the theories about what red is? That is qualia, by the way, right? You're, you're defining qualia. Yes, yes. Um, I think that that's a really interesting thing to think about. I think, of course, that's going to have um, an, an effect. I mean, I know you're talking about a concept underlying that, but I just want to point out the reaction of people who put on uh, the colorblind lenses, the corrective ones that experience colors in their true form uh, for the first time, and they're essentially blown away by what they're seeing. They have a very visceral and emotional reaction at experiencing it. And I know that's not essentially, it's not the point, but I just wanted to... No, I, th I think that is the point. I think that for, for me, the answer is yes. 100%. Qualia is, it, it is real. That, that is qualia, what you just described of is it's, uh, I've heard it put as the isness of being or something to that effect. It's just the, the actual felt experience. The, the, again, the subjective qualitative nature of experience. Okay. Um, I, those those um, videos that I'm referring to, they really get me because I have a son that's colorblind. And to think that he's missing out on um, the world in that way, seeing people's uh, emotional reactions, like, gets to me. I want to get him a pair of those glasses. Um, but intros, UFO intros, I've never heard of you. Go ahead. Yeah. I love that um, this is Dust Space and uh, Kimball's in here and we're discussing qualia. I just love that. Um, I, that's a callback, but I, I have another comment to add. Just give me like maybe another 30 seconds. Well, I, I just want to say, I don't think, uh, you know, anyone's missing out on anything from being colorblind. I don't, I actually think that the concept of NPCs is extremely problematic. Uh, this has come up in some recent, recent conversations, actually. Uh, I think uh, Kelly Chase discussed this on UFO Rabbit Hole with uh, Dr. Michael Masters, if you want to hear a little bit more about that, although they didn't really dive deep on it. I really think that, that the overall concept uh, of, you know, people looking at others as, as NPCs, while it, it might be compelling and there might even be something to it, I prefer not to to even really engage with it that much because I think it's really problematic. Agreed. Anybody who calls anyone else an NPC is actually the NPC. Joking, but you know what I mean. But Dub, exactly. one thing to you to assuage any kind of concern you might have, and this is really the beauty of it, the, the beauty of consciousness and what it means to be a fully alive, conscious human being. I just want all of you guys to reflect for a moment. When we talk about qualia, that whole Mary's room was just about seeing the color red on an apple. Do you ever realize every day, every moment, how much richness and depth of experience we are going through every single moment? How much variety of experiences we encounter every single day, whether that be in like a loving conversation with someone or an intellectually stimulating conversation like this one, whether that be, you know, when you're lifting weights or having sex or having a meal or, you know, drinking water or looking at a beautiful flower 
flower or experiencing the sun on your skin, listening to music you love. Do you guys realize how deep and majestic consciousness is? And that's my point is that, you know, your son, you know, yeah, in some aspect, he has a less perception of color, but that does not take away from every other depth and dimension of experience that he can experience and he does experience right every human being has a different or fractal cosmic consciousness every human being experiences life and cost consciousness in its own unique way that doesn't make anyone better or worse than another think of this real quick experience. yes can i just interject like honestly no, I'm, done. I'm done i'm done your son being That's colorblind he probably experiences other things in like a greater like he pays attention to other things more than most people and that would give him like other advantage right in a weird way well i kind of have a lot to say about this uh because my dad is colorblind as well i'm the carrier therefore i gave it to my son um but you're right there it's not a big deal in the grand scheme there are a few things that you cannot do as an occupation if you are colorblind those are very small and the likelihood of him trying to do those things is very limited anyways but it does cause some problems because everybody essentially blows it off like it's not a big deal when in their younger years, when they're growing up, um, when he first discovers and we first realize that he is colorblind, how is that discovery made? It's because he's struggling in art class. He doesn't want to pay attention. He doesn't give a shit um, about creating art because he can't see, I think, I, like after conversations with him and stuff, um, he's just not interested in it because he can't see the brightness of the colors. They aren't appealing to him. And so he doesn't want to create the art. So he's not focusing. And then he's talking to the kids next. You know, so there is small um, things that occur. Now we know more now and knowledge is power. So we know how to deal with those things um, and try and, you know, approach him in a way that can wrap him into the activity or what have you. Right. Um, but go. I'm going to find some of the videos of grown men tall, stoic, manly men putting on the corrective lenses and experiencing looking at balloons for the first time or the grass. My dad sees grass as brown orange. Think about how many times you've looked at a landscape and it's just been bright. You know, it's green and there's different shades of green and the, the trees are so beautiful blowing in the wind and I mean, maybe it's still beautiful with the different colors, but I don't know. There's definitely a difference there. Um, How much are these glasses? Like, yeah, and here's the other thing I wanted to add at that question. So not only is color blindness, it's obviously not, you know, there's an argument to be made that it's actually not like a disability or anything like that. People can overcome these things. It's not going to derail someone's life. But in the elementary level, um, it does create problems, but those problems are, again, blown off by both the pediatrician as not a big deal, um, and it's not really recognized as a need or attention, like, they aren't going to spend extra time to focus on helping my son in art because of this reason, um, meaning, like, special education. Did he get teased in elementary school for that? What's that? I'm sorry to cut you off. Did he get teased in elementary school? Um, when he first realized, like when we realized, like for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, he did. Cause he was misnaming colors and the teacher did it in front of everybody. And that actually had to happen to my dad as well. He has like stories about getting made fun of. It's not a huge deal. Like we're gonna, everybody's fine. I'm not trying to say thousands of dollars. Sorry. I'm curious on this price point. Okay. Here. So I was, I was getting to that. So Go because find it's not recognized <laughs> as an actual problem, insurance isn't going to cover it. Um, your vision insurance won't cover corrective lenses, so it's going to be cash out of pocket. So, depending on the frame and whatever, I want to say they start at like three hundred bucks. So it's not on a, it's not not doable. But do I want to spend three hundred dollars now um, on my child that's over five, under ten, who might break those glasses, or what's going to happen? You know, if I spend all that money and is he responsible enough to, to deal with those? And you're not supposed to wear them all the time. So he would be taking them off and putting them on repeatedly throughout the day. You know, so it's just a lot that I've thought about. This is such a tangent. I'm sorry. That's a good point. Topic. That's a, I didn't notice. I didn't know he was a younger boy too. That's a good point. I, I'm just glad. I'm just, I'm just glad they're not like $3,000. But if you do want to make that leap, I mean, I bet 
you could do a buy me coffee app and save up. Um, people love your spaces for sure. And, and, uh, at that age though, it, it is kind of a tricky thing with glasses in general, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I just wanted to be clear too. And, and thank you uh, for going into this stuff. I think this is a, a really great conversation. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, like uh, I said, you know, no, nobody's missing anything by being colorblind or whatever. I, I really was just, I don't know, uh, be, being overly, overly something by saying that like, you know, it, it doesn't prevent you from, from having a fulfilled life. And my, my nephew, uh, uh, is autistic. We're just learning. He's still extremely young. He's not even four years old yet, but you know, the, the signs are all there and they, they've been working with, a uh, uh, you know, a, a team, a child study team to help out with that and stuff. And, and when it, when it comes to this, this concept of like, I don't know, um, what makes a, a fulfilled human being or a real human being or anything. I just, I, I tend to never want to look at anybody at all as less than, and this is, I, I think, uh, actually a really big problem within the UFO community and especially within like conspiracy communities at large is that there are so many people and I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody in this space of this, but there are people that truly believe that, you know, there, there are folks out there, people on this planet who are, uh, either like, you know, aliens and therefore not human or NPCs or they're reptilians or they are, uh, you know, just, just some type of, of something that, that they consider to be other. And I think that that othering is a huge problem and I, I don't participate in that. And Paul, if I would just add to that, okay, the question is, who's judging what's the criteria on what makes someone better than another person okay because i'll tell you this okay there are many qualities humans uh, you know value amongst each other but i'll tell you this okay to me like things like courage integrity loyalty okay sincerity kindness they're far more valuable than things like intelligence or um you know a lot of these things that we put a lot of value in. And the reason I say that specifically is I would much rather have a group of, you know, uh, comrades or a society of people that are courageous and maybe not super intelligent versus what we have right now, which is a bunch of very intelligent people that completely lack courage and therefore are stuck in stagnation and can't actually do anything that needs to be done because they lack any courage whatsoever so the reason i say this is you know one example i would like to raise often see i'm coming obviously from a spiritual and theological perspective so the idea of god is very essential for me from this perspective to have that kind of objective all observing all encompassing observer right but that aside just this general idea just consider two people like you know in our societies we glorify things like what the famous movie star okay historically the great conquering hero the great general the great warrior this and that you know achilles hercules blah 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 okay but what i would suggest is i want you to think about for a moment just a humble simple family man some guy who works day in and day out tirelessly for his kids for his wife loyal you know diligent hard working just a humble simple guy okay is that person better or worse than some great epic conquering hero that they write songs about who's responsible for thousands and thousands of deaths, who uh, rapes women, pillages cities, okay? Do you get what I'm saying? How do we determine greatness? Who's determining greatness? So I agree with you completely, Paul. Like, it's only, I think, a lesser... I mean, I'm not saying this in that kind of way, but I think the lower form of consciousness, ironically, is the one that ranks other people, you know, and tries to judge people based on who's better or worse. It's not about better or worse. What it's about is that there will never be another you and there never was another you and you are so special. And it's about your own journey into becoming the best that you can be and bringing what only you uniquely can bring. That's what it's all about. That's all it is. Ish, that, that, was, that was honestly really beautifully said. I really appreciate that. I, uh, I feel the same way and I, I, th I, I often look at it, um, I don't know, it could get mushy, but I don't know, I, I feel like everybody kind of contributes to the Godhead in their own way, not, not to get all religious about it, but like, I don't know, I, I, or it, it's not like, you know, there, there are people 
human beings that are suffering tremendously. But I really feel like there is a, a contribution everywhere. And I just, I, 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 I really, I, I don't know. I'm a humanitarian, I guess. I don't even know if that's the word, but whatever. I, I just really appreciate it. You're, uh, you're just a human. You're just a caring, conscious <laughs> human. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Kendall, did you remember? You had, 30, you had much more than 30 seconds. Yeah, go ahead, Nufo. Yeah, I meant to Google this. I was doing some other things. But uh, I, I do believe that colorblindness is more prevalent in, in males. And I don't know the like um, evolutionary biology science behind all this, but... Um, just in the hunter gatherer stage, like females typically stayed back. Right. And they were much better at like identifying herbs and like different edible vegetation and, co and cooking shit at the camp. Right. And the males were out hunting protein. Yeah. There's, I, there's, I don't know if that has something to do with it. Well, no, no, that is, that is the, no, 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 no. That's the running theory. I'm free coming out like an asshole. Like I'm sorry. Know, that's the running theory. Real quick. Okay, it doesn't matter. Point being is um, your son, whether it does, I don't know any girls who are colorblind, but it's just an, it's one thing that as a male specifically, you're not, so men, when they have these kind of like very subtle ineptitudes, right? And like, I loved what, uh, you know, it might've been another space. Oh, I know where this is going. About, like, I know where this is going. No, I'm just, Go ahead. Okay. Floor is yours. No, you can finish for me, Dove. <laughs> Dude, no one's coming in. I just, uh, men, are, men are allowed <laughs> to be like publicly sensitive or emotional about things. Cause, uh, again, I think it gets back to actually what Ish was just saying, which is, uh, biologically, like, uh, just, I know, you know, I'm not going to put that language to it cause I don't trigger some people, but basically, like, people have like a base, um, very primal, not really conscious perception of the world and people and and masculine equals like big and uh you know not like emotionless a little bit i'm these are generalities right they're stupid but and then uh femininity equals like more petite and and more sensitive uh i just am saying like it's harder for a, a boy who has that and was teased by like for it it's it just especially at that early of an age when you're you're so early in your um, neurological development, it makes you feel like you're less than or not as good, right? And that actually does have, although subtle, it has like lifelong implications. Okay, and that's definitely something to like pay attention to. Yeah, it is something to pay attention to. You went exactly where I thought you were going to go. So, um, the reason that it occurs more in males than females is because. I don't know the actual words for this. It's a sex linked disorder or anomaly, right? So whatever it is, is attached somewhere to the X or Y. I don't know. It's going to occur more in males based on it's like a sex linked chromosomal issue. So the likelihood I am a carrier, but it actually occurring. I don't know if this is like my Punnett square type thing where um, it's a recessive trait. And does anybody know what I'm kind of getting at? So the actual, it, it goes yeah, the, I think it's a mutation that occurs more in, in it's the X, sex, it's right? the X chromosome it is what right. the and I have dealer. two of those, but I don't know the, 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 the occurrence of me being a carrier or me actually expressing that, um, anomaly or whatever is less likely to occur in females versus males for whatever reason. No, I'm sure there's a video. It's because you would have to have two X chromosomes that contain that trait as a female, as opposed to a male, you, you, you just have to have the one. Uh, there you go. Boom. Yeah. Boom. That's what so it is. From like a, have, um, like a percentages or a likelihood. It's that's, that's why your Punnett squares. And, and, and Kimball, I'm sorry for cutting you off. Don't call me an asshole. I, I was I was I was affirming what you were saying about it. Uh, 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 you know, coming about more in males. Please be a little bit more generous with me. I mean, you could have just waited to affirm that, but our own life experiences have informed us to behave differently, right? We're not going to derail this space. I'm going to derail the shit out of it. I'm just <laughs> uh, I wanted to add in my 
my thing here. Uh, I was tested for Down syndrome in utero because they thought I had Down syndrome, guys. So if I had Down syndrome, I don't know if I'd be here today talking with all of you. So I'm glad I got tested genetically. <laughs> but also, um, you know, Kimball, it, it's interesting to hear that perspective. And I, I, you know, I, don't, I think that's pretty, pretty status quo. Um, you know, it's weird hearing it though, because I'm a pretty androgynous woman myself. Like I have a lot of like not petite characteristics and I'm like brash and strange. (laughs) So it's, it's, it's interesting when you put it that way. I'm like, Oh, I wonder what it's like to be like petite and sensitive. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, we, so, we and Deb are the only ladies here, though. Um, in the so. nest, what do you think, Deb? I just wanted to add that I did the the thing that I the YouTube video that I linked in the nest. You have to actually watch it yourself. But those are people putting on the Enchroma. That's the brand name of the corrective lenses. Um, for the first time, there are multiple females, so it does happen in females. It's just a little bit less prevalent um, because it's you know the sex linked chromosome. So uh, I, I just wanted to say that. But either way, it's the reaction is, I don't know, watch it and try not to kind of cry with them sometimes um, because it's, it's intense. It, it kind of just gives you like a little bit of perspective on what they were missing out on. And they don't even realize it until they put on those glasses. That's crazy. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Oh, hey, um, it's not pressing. I guess um, I just want to say uh, thanks for holding the space. Um, I uh, had, had just stuck around uh, in case uh, this um, clip, which I uh, thought was on, but I kind of just walked it into the room. So, um, uh, and uh, now you uh, guys have a good topic um, uh, and all, but uh, yeah. So I just want to say good night and uh, thanks for hosting the space. So did you share the uh, clip in the comments or do you want to play it really quick? I don't care. Go ahead if you want. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to uh, put it out if it's not um, uh, uh, interesting, but I think it's on topic, um, and uh, it mentions Herrera explicitly and kind of um, gives a overview of a program. And it's just about a minute and a half, and I've got it at 1.25 speed to um, speed things along. So, uh, here goes. Uh, yep, I know UATs well, well, work worse, worse than the covert drug running programs are the human trafficking going on by these UAV systems, and those are the ones that, when Herrera, Michael Herrera, the Marine, saw that, the crate, it turns out, we the command surface came to the meeting that you were at, who uh, is very high up in the system, and he has been involved actively for years in programs where they go to impoverished areas and basically kidnap people to put them into these experimental programs that they're trafficking them often on the man-made uh, UAPs, like that big circular one that Herrera saw. Now, sometimes they're traffic conventional uh, with helos, helicopters, and what have you. But those are used in UFO tracking programs. It's, this is bizarre stuff. Uh, and they basically turn these people into bio-machines interfacing with technology and with certain drugs to make uh, something happen that I refer to as hacking into the guidance and control systems of ET vehicles and bringing them in so we can hit them and kill them. So, thank you for sharing that. I think that was Greer speaking. What podcast was that from? Um, That is the uh, one I mentioned before. It's under his channel at Breaking News, um, Rogue Black Budget Programs 2024. Um, This is not old. This is a month old. So, um. okay. Um, thank you. I, I knew it was Greer. So, <clears throat> if anybody wants to finish up on the color blindness talk, we can do like a you know we can finish that talk. But I do have the clip of Herrera um, from today's podcast talking about the deep underground military bases, and I believe this is the one where he does um, speak a little bit about. I think this is the right clip where he talks about the same thing. That was in Nathaniel's clips, like the humans or something. Um, I can play that. Does anybody else have any final comments on colorblindness? Thanks for sharing your story, Dev. Uh, I'm going to check those videos out. I like a good emotional video. Makes me happy. Yep. It's a good contrast <laughs> to this fucked up shit. Like, oh yeah, I can still like 
get emotional about this stuff. But yeah, um, so the only other thing I wanted to say, my final thought about that is that, I don't know. So I'm a carrier for that. And I was worried maybe my daughter had it, but time will tell. My other son does not have it, and his artwork is bright and colorful and beautiful. Um, and then um, I'm also, I do have other one other like trait or whatever that's recessive. Um, that needs two recessive genes to be expressed, and it is. So that's kind of weird. I just kind of realized that I have two of those, so. That's strange, actually. You have a lot of gene stuff going on, Dove. Um, are you ladylike? My mom would always tell me to be ladylike. Are you a lady, uh, like maybe Kimball was saying? <laughs> I, I'm i a lady. I have three kids. And no, I mean, I think I, I, I kind of identify with what you're saying. Like, I definitely have, like, more masculine traits for sure. I am at its base, uh, a decent athlete. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was wondering. Just because you're kind of with the with the genes and the UFO interest and the the you know maybe not quite the status quo. I don't know. It's just you're kind of an interesting personality, is all. So I was just curious. Uh, it was not directed towards any specific topic. Oh, I'm but, a fucking weirdo for sure. But no, um, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I thought that that, I just kind of realized that while we were talking about that. Um, weird. Yeah, fucking weirdo for sure. That's me. Anyways, um, so I'm going to play this clip. I, I, this is definitely about deep underground military bases. I don't know if it talks about everything, but here we go. Boom, boom, boom. Based on that, yes, these installations for the most part are subterranean. And they, they go down several, <laughs> several levels. Um, I can't give specifics, but um, they are real. Deep underground military bases are a real thing. It's the most common practice for all this technology because they have somewhere to store it and it's safe from nuclear fallout, nuclear exchange. So uh, I wish I could talk about it further, but I honestly can't. So um, maybe one day in the future I will be able to. And uh, when that does happen, I'll be able to point um, and paint a picture for everybody so they understand. But it's a lot of money that to, to fund these. And what the interesting thing about this too is all these installations are very self-sufficient. You know, so... The, the, you know, everybody's asked, well, what about the janitors? What about the people who, you know, prep the food or, you know, do facilities maintenance? Like, wh why don't they come forward? Well, they're also taken in a demographic of people that may not have this ability with P3 when they're screened, but they use these refugees also to use this. And if they're given a good lifestyle, they're taken care of, they have medical, they've got education, their families are taken care of, then they can, they will not come forward and risk their livelihood because they're technically illegal uh, immigrants. And who there's a risk that let's say if they were to get deported or something they'd have to go back to where they're at they don't want to go back to a poverty area they want to mm -hmm. stay in the program they're doing because they're taken care of sure. and uh, that's, that's kind sense. of that's yeah. the, it's, because what they've expressed is that if you're to go liberate people in these installations they are people who don't want to be liberated they want to mm -hmm. just resume their lifestyle because they're, they're they're given everything they need more than what they would be in the original um environment that they come from go ahead john yeah i'll, I'll just want to wait I, I i need to get that documentation before Okay, so when I posted this clip, it's on my, um, I posted it two hours ago, so if anybody wants to reference that, I wrote, almost every single thing he says here sounds absolutely plausible in my opinion. Now, I don't know if what he's saying is the truth, but the reasoning behind when he explains that these people might not want to come forward because they're vulnerable to being deported or whatever, that sounds plausible and I know I'm a conspiracy theorist but I I do believe like the more sinister aspects possibly of some of our government or our military or the shadow government or whatever it is would engage in this type of thing I don't know for sure but it doesn't behoove uh credul credulity or whatever they say um even when you think about people like a cult or something like a like a predatory cult trying to find people to um, recruit to be one of their people or whatever. They're going to go after vulnerable people that need things. And uh, they're, whether that's food or money or shelter or protection, um, those people are targeted for a reason. And that is why I mean it sounds plausible. <laughs> 